Hey, Angela, all we're seeing is Zoom track two. Is that what we should be seeing? We are good.
Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our next E3 Summit session. It's not just pollen, critical uh, allergy and immunology questions answered. We are getting ready to get started here. And before we jump in, I want to just introduce myself and who all you'll have with you here tonight. Um, my name is Angela Christ. I am the director of the Lois Deet Syndrome Foundation at, and also the director of marketing at the Marfan Foundation. And with us tonight, we have Helene Baruch, who is our chief philanthropy officer, and she will be your chat hostess with the mostess. <laughs> she is wonderful, and she will be posting all kinds of extra information for you and links to things in the chat. Um, also, we have Dr. Pam Guerrero on with us tonight as our um, expert on this topic, who will be sharing the information and answering questions a little bit later on. So we are all thrilled to have you participate in the International E3 Summit, which is brought to you by the Marfan Foundation and its divisions, the Lois Dietz Syndrome Foundation and the VEDS Movement, and our partners in Europe at Vesser. We are very grateful to our presenting sponsors, Brigham and Women's Hospital and American Communication Construction. Before, you, before we start, I do want to let you all know that the International E3 Summit is a forum to provide an open discussion of issues related to genetic aortic conditions and vascular conditions. Opinions stated in each of these talks are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of the Marfan Foundation or Vestern. Tonight, we are fortunate to have Dr. Pam Guerrero with us uh, to, to present on this topic of allergy and immunology. And I just wanted to take a minute to hand it over to um, Dr. Guerrero, if you would like to introduce yourself or say hello um, before we get started. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Pam Guerrero. I am Chief of Allergic Diseases at the NIH, the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. And I am really happy to be here to talk to you about allergies and Lloyd's Deet Syndrome. Thanks so much. Um, following the presentation, there will be lots of time for your questions. So please put them in the Q&A section for, the, um, for this session in the app. Um, you, whether you're using the Whova website or the app, there should be Q and A. Um, chat will be where we're doing some different uh, discussions or sharing links about things that might also be relevant to questions you might have or or to having Louis Deet syndrome. Um, but Q and A for any questions that you would like uh, Dr. Guerrero to answer tonight. We'll do our best to answer as many of those as we can. No guarantees, unfortunately. I saw there were already a lot in there, which is wonderful. Uh, but we do ask that if you try to ask your questions about giving out too many personal details about your situation, if you have a very specific question you would like answered, you can always submit it through our Help and Resource Center uh, during E3. We're asking you to submit those at marfan.org slash E3ask and we will get back to you as quickly as we can. You, um, I'm sure you can understand the volume has, has gotten very high for questions, which is wonderful. Um, we want to help you get the answers that you need either through this session or after, uh, because that's why we're here. And we want to be sure that you have everything you need to be able to live with your condition or support someone with it as best you can. Okay, so. At this time, I'm gonna get started um, with Dr. Guerrero's presentation and we will um, be ready for Q&A after that. Oops. Hello everyone, my name is Pam. Sorry. Pam Guerrero and I am Chief of the Laboratory of Allergic Diseases at the National Institutes of Health. Today I'm going to be talking about allergic disease and its connection to Lois Dietz syndrome. 
First, what exactly is an allergy? One of the primary jobs of the immune system is to protect us against infections. To do this, the immune system must be able to distinguish between substances in our environment that need to be attacked, such as bacteria and viruses that cause disease, from substances that are foreign to our body but are not harmful, such as pollen and food proteins. An allergy results then when the immune system reacts against one of these innocuous substances in our environment. I'm willing to bet that nearly all of you watching this have or know someone who has an allergic disease because these conditions are extremely common. Over 50 million Americans are affected, making allergies the fifth most, most common chronic disease to affect adults and the third most common to affect children. The prevalence of allergic disease tends to peak early in life. 80% of people who have allergies exhibit symptoms by age 20 years old, 40% by age 6, and 20% by age 3. The prevalence of the different forms of allergic disease do vary by age. The term atopic march is sometimes used to refer to this typical progression of allergic disease, which usually starts as atopic dermatitis or eczema and food allergy in infancy and early childhood. These are often outgrown by late childhood when there is an increase in asthma and allergic rhinitis. It's been known for a long time now that TGF-beta plays a very important role in how our immune system develops and functions. So we felt it was important to study how the immune system might be affected in people with Lowy's Dietz syndrome. What we learned is that people with Lowy's Dietz syndrome are more likely to develop essentially all forms of allergic disease. And we published those results a few years ago in the paper shown here. The most common allergic disease to affect people, both in the general population and those with LDS, is allergic rhinitis. This is not a life-threatening condition, but can certainly have a tremendous negative impact on quality of life. People with allergic rhinitis typically experience runny nose and congestion, coughing and sneezing, watery, itchy eyes and nose, and if they have asthma, it can certainly worsen their symptoms there as well. Allergic rhinitis can also affect people's sleep and their overall quality of life. Some people only experience these symptoms at particular times of year, such as the spring and fall, but this really depends on what you're allergic to. Here on the East Coast, tree pollen tends to peak in the early spring, grasses in the summer, and weeds in the fall. However, people who are allergic to molds and pets or dust mites may have symptoms all year round. In our research, we found that nearly half of people with Lowy's Dietz syndrome had been diagnosed with allergic rhinitis, which is significantly higher than what you see in the general population, where about 20% of people are affected. There are two main methods allergists use to determine what you are allergic to. Both these methods are looking for the presence of IgE, the allergic antibody that is specific for a given allergen. With skin testing, we introduce a very tiny amount of the allergic substance under the skin. And if the person is allergic to that substance and has IgE to that allergen, the allergic cells in their skin will become activated. And this results in swelling and redness that looks a lot like a mosquito bite. In addition to skin testing, we can also measure the level of IgE specific for different allergens in the blood. Once a diagnosis of allergic rhinitis is made, allergen avoidance is a key part of the treatment plan. This can be difficult, as you might expect, for patients with pollen allergy. For these people, it can be helpful to try and limit time outdoors on days when pollen counts are very high. Certainly keeping the windows closed and using air conditioning when that's possible, and even simple things like changing clothes after spending time outside and showering before bed can help reduce overall pollen exposure. If you're allergic to cats or dogs, a HEPA filter on your vacuum cleaner or a HEPA filter uh, air purifier can also be helpful. Dust mite covers um, can be helpful in patients with dust mite allergy. Dust mites also tend to thrive in moist environments, so we generally recommend that people with significant dust mite allergy try to keep the relative humidity in their home under 50%. If it's possible, and this isn't always the case, but removing carpeting as much as you can from your home can also reduce your exposure. And then washing your bed sheets at least once a week in very hot water. If allergen avoidance is not sufficient to control symptoms, the next step is usually to use as needed medications such as antihistamines, both for symptom relief and to control symptoms. If this is not adequate, then the next step is typically to add an intranasal corticosteroid spray. 
Many studies now have found that steroid nasal sprays are among the most effective treatments we have for allergic rhinitis, but it's really important that people use them on a daily basis in order for them to be effective. And then finally, allergy shots, which are also sometimes called allergen immunotherapy, can be recommended when the response to medications for allergic rhinitis are not adequate. Although the exact mechanisms by which allergy shots work are not entirely understood, 70 to 80 percent of people do show clinical improvement. This is a very time-consuming process. Most people require weekly shots for a period of months, which are then spaced every two weeks for three to five years. However, because we are injecting the exact substances that people are allergic to, it's not uncommon for patients to experience allergic reactions during the course of treatment. And in some cases, those reactions are severe and need to be treated with epinephrine. And while epinephrine is extremely effective at treating severe allergic reactions, it does so by increasing blood pressure and acting on the heart, which are not desirable effects in someone with LDS. For that reason, we generally recommend that people with LDS avoid receiving allergy shots, particularly since we can't usually maintain adequate control of symptoms with medications. So asthma is another common allergic condition, both in the general population and among people with Lois Dietz syndrome. Asthma is a condition where the airways, the tubes that bring air to and from the lungs, tighten up and become very narrow because of swelling, the accumulation of mucus and inflammation. There are many different triggers for asthma attacks, including exposure to allergens, cigarette smoke, cold air, pollutants, even exercise and certain viral infections. One of the primary symptoms in patients with asthma is cough, especially at night and in the early morning, wheezing, shortness of breath, and the sensation of chest tightness. The main medications that are used to treat asthma are really focused on trying to treat the, or relaxing the airways that allow them to open up and allow air in and out, as well as treating the underlying inflammation. So why asthma affects just under 10% of people in the general population, 45% of people with LDS in our study have been diagnosed with asthma at some point in their lifetime by their doctor, and almost 40% required daily medication to control their asthma. In our experience, we have found that chronic sinus infections can sometimes be a trigger for asthma in some people with Lois D syndrome. This increase in sinus infections does not seem to be the result of a defect in the immune system or reduced ability to fight infections, but is more likely related to the structure of the bones of the skull and how the sinuses drain. Aggressive treatment of sinus infections, sometimes which involves several weeks of antibiotics, can be necessary and seems to dramatically improve their asthma, at least in some patients with LDS. Eczema, which is also known as atopic dermatitis, is a chronic skin disease that is diagnosed clinically and is characterized by itchy, red, inflamed, and dry skin. The primary treatments for eczema are really focused on improving hydration of the skin with emollients and other medications that can treat the underlying inflammation. Eczema is also more common in people with LDS, affecting up to 40% of patients compared to only 10 to 20% of people in the general population. Food allergy is also more common in people with LDS, although it can be challenging to distinguish food intolerances from true food allergy. Food allergy is an immune response to the food, and it's related specifically to the protein in the food, whereas most intolerances are related to the carbohydrate content. A good example is lactose intolerance, where patients are missing the enzyme that breaks down the sugar in the food. With food allergy, even very tiny amounts of the food can trigger an allergic reaction, and in some cases, these reactions can be severe and life-threatening. Using a very strict definition of food allergy, where people had to have a convincing history of an allergic reaction to the food, along with positive Ig testing to that food, we found that over 30% of people with LDS have food allergy, compared to only 3 to 6% of children in the general population. Many LDS patients are allergic to multiple foods, but some are allergic to only one or two. 
It's important to recognize that our current tests for food allergy are not perfect, and some people will have a positive test to food and not actually be allergic to it. The best test for a food allergy is whether you have a reaction or not when you eat the food. As I mentioned earlier, there is no question that epinephrine can be life-saving if a person is having a life-threatening reaction to a food. And we do recommend that anyone with LDS who has a food allergy always have an EpiPen available. However, as I mentioned earlier, because of the effects of epinephrine on the cardiovascular system, we are more cautious about using it in people with LDS, and we would generally treat mild local reactions with an antihistamine and reserve epinephrine if the reaction becomes systemic and potentially life-threatening. This is something that's important to discuss with your child's school and daycare, since some schools, for example, may have a policy where they administer epinephrine if there is only a suspicion that the child ate a food they were allergic to, even if they aren't showing symptoms. So the most common food allergies in people with LDS mimic those that we see in the general population with milk, egg, peanut, soy, wheat, nuts, and fish, as well as sesame at the top of the list in younger children. And then in teenagers and adults, the most common allergies are peanuts, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish. The type of symptoms that might indicate the presence of a food allergy can range from chronic low-grade symptoms that might just affect the GI tract to more acute life-threatening reactions. Some symptoms that would suggest the presence of food allergy include hives or swelling, trouble breathing or cough, and then in severe anaphylactic cases, a drop in blood pressure and other symptoms of anaphylaxis. Right now, the only treatment we have for most food allergies is strict avoidance of the food and access to self-injectable epinephrine in the event of an accidental exposure to the food. However, this changed in January of this year when the FDA approved the first oral immunotherapy or OIT product for peanut allergy. With OIT, patients allergic to peanut actually ingest peanut powder, starting in very tiny doses and then increasing over the course of weeks or months until they reach a maintenance dose, which they then take da daily. This peanut OIT product has only been approved for use in children, and patients must still strictly avoid peanut while they, were on, while they are on this treatment. The goal here is to protect against allergic reactions that might result from an accidental exposure to peanut rather than to allow patients to fully introduce peanut into their diet. In the studies that have been done, almost 60 to 70 percent of children were able to tolerate a single peanut kernel after treatment, while that amount was enough to cause an allergic reaction before starting treatment. However, OIT has an extremely high rate of side effects, and that causes many children up to 20 percent to stop treatment. And many children will need to use epinephrine to treat allergic reactions which is perhaps not surprising because we are giving the children the food that they're actually allergic to. Again, this is a particular concern for people with low LDS, and for that reason, it, we would not recommend that anyone with LDS who has peanut allergy undertake this treatment. In our studies, we have also found that people with LDS were more likely to have an allergic condition known as eosinophilic GI disease. Eosinophils are a type of white blood cell that evolved to help us fight parasitic infections, but now that these types of infections are less of an issue with our clean water supply and better sanitation, eosinophils are better recognized for their role in allergic disease. Eosinophils accumulate in the skin in people who have eczema and the lungs of people who have asthma. However, when they accumulate in the GI tract, and specifically the esophagus, they can lead to a condition called eosinophilic esophagitis, or EOE, which is the most common type that we see in patients with Lois Dietz syndrome. The esophagus is the tube that leads from the mouth to the stomach, and in healthy people, the esophagus does not contain any eosinophils. However, in people with EOE, eosinophils accumulate in the esophagus, and this is associated with esophageal dysfunction. Unfortunately, the only way to diagnose EOE is with an endoscopy where they put a camera down the esophagus and take a small piece of tissue to look at it under the microscope. In patients with EOE, you can see these bright pink cells that are the eosinophils.
EOE is relatively rare in the general population, affecting less than 1%, only 0.05% of the population, but it's quite common in people with LDS, affecting up to 10% of LDS patients, using a quite strict definition. We suspect that this may underrepresent how common EOE is in LDS, since nearly 30% of the patients in our study had symptoms suggestive of EOE, but just had not undergone an endoscopy to confirm the diagnosis. The symptoms that a patient with EOE experiences really depends on their age. In young children, sometimes the only symptom we see is poor growth or difficulty with feeding. In older children and adults, by far the most common symptom is difficulty swallowing. And in some cases, food actually gets stuck in the esophagus and has to be removed endoscopically. And then really at any age, you can see diarrhea, abdominal pain, or difficulty gaining weight. The biggest long-term worry with EOE is the development of scar tissue in the esophagus that can lead to a stricture or narrowing of the esophagus. And so the overall goal of treatment is to reduce the inflammation and prevent this scar tissue or fibrosis from developing. There are currently no FDA-approved treatments for EOE, but common therapies include medications such as proton pump inhibitors and topical steroids, as well as food elimination diets. And there are a number of other investigational biologic therapies that are also being studied right now. However, the choice of which of these treatments to do really should be individualized and is really should be a patient-driven decision, taking into consideration the person's other comorbidities, such as food allergy, their age, their resources, and what would really fit their lifestyle. Proton pump inhibitors, or PPIs, including Prilosec, Prevacid, and Nexium, are most commonly used to treat gastroesophageal reflux disease, but they can also be very effective at treating EOE. When they looked across 33 different studies that included over 600 patients with EOE, they found that almost 60, little over 60%, reported that their symptoms of EOE improved on a PPI, and over half of these patients saw reduced numbers of eosinophils on their biopsies. Interestingly, the benefit of PPIs appears to be independent of its effect on reducing acid production in the stomach. It's still debated how long people should remain on PPIs to treat EOE. There are potentially some unwanted side effects of reducing acid in the stomach long term, since this can inhibit the absorption of calcium, and acid is also needed to kill certain harmful bacteria in the stomach, which may explain why C. diff infections have been reported to be more common in people who receive PPIs. Topical steroids are also frequently used to treat EOE. The idea here is to coat the lining of the esophagus with steroids to treat the inflammation. The two steroids that have been used most frequently are Flovent or a slurry of budesonide. Both of these are medications that are frequently used to treat asthma, but instead of breathing the medication, the patient swallows it. Many patients respond quite well to these treatments. Over half of patients who have received fluticasone or Flovent show improvement in their symptoms, and that may be even higher at a higher dose of Flovent, up to 65%. There have been no head-to-head -head trials comparing Flovent and budesonide, but there is some suggestion in some studies that budesonide may work a bit better, perhaps because it's given as a slurry and has longer contact with the esophagus. Importantly, these treatments reduce both the inflammation as well as the long-term scar tissue and prevent it from developing. However, this is not a cure. Almost all patients will experience a recurrence of their symptoms once they stop treatment. The long-term safety of swallow steroids is something that's still being studied. So food elimination diets are another common strategy used to treat EOE, and in general, the more restrictive to the diet, the more effective it is, but also the more difficult it is to adhere to. And so the decision about which foods to avoid and whether to go down uh, the route of elimination really needs to be a decision that is made with the patient considering their baseline diet. For example, people who also have IgE-mediated food allergy may already be following a very restricted diet. So taking additional foods out of their diet may put them at risk for nutritional deficiencies. It can be very expensive to follow these diets since you may need to shop at specialty grocery stores that have allergy-friendly foods, which tend to be more expensive. Age is also an important consideration. If you're a teenager or an adult, it can be much harder to remove a food from your diet that you've been eating your whole life compared to an infant who may have only had a limited number of solid foods in their diet. 
So the elemental diet, which usually involves a formula that contains no intact protein, is probably the most effective treatment we have for EOE. Over 90% of both children and adults with EOE will respond to this. However, this effectiveness does come at a cost. As you might guess, many of these formulas do not taste very good, and many patients require an NG or nasogastric tube or G tube in order to take a sufficient quantity to support their growth and nutrition. For this reason, these treatments are hard to stick with. In a recent study, almost a third of adults were not able to stick to this diet for even a month, and there is no doubt that there are social and psychological consequences of not eating solid food. Another important consideration worth mentioning is the importance of working on oral skills in infants and young children who are put on an elemental formula. This age group usually tolerates it the best since they're used to receiving formula, but this is also a critical age to learn the skills for eating. Less extreme than the elemental diet is the four food elimination diet, which is based on the idea that empirically removing four foods that are most likely to cause IgE mated food allergy may also be effective in treating EOE. So these foods include milk, wheat, egg, and legumes. This approach also has quite a high response rate. 64% of both children and adults have shown that they do respond. The good news is that most people are able to reintroduce at least a subset of these foods back into their diet. And it is certainly recommended that once you achieve control of the symptoms and the inflammation has improved, that the patient try to reintroduce the foods one at a time. As you can see here, milk is the most common culprit that triggers EOE, 85% of cases followed by egg, wheat, and soy. So this, of course, begs the question then, if milk and these few foods are the trigger of most patients, wouldn't it be better to do a step-up approach rather than a step-down approach? So for some patients, it may make the most sense to eliminate milk and or wheat first and then add additional foods to the elimination diet if that doesn't work. Studies have found that at least half of adults and children would respond to this more limited elimination diet. Interestingly, the same foods tend to be culprits around the world with milk at the top of the list, causing being the single most common trigger in 66% of patients. And this is followed again by wheat in another quarter of patients, as well as egg at around the same level. Overall, about 30 to 50% of patients with EOE have a single food that triggers their EOE. 30% have two causative foods, and just under a third have three or more foods that drives their EOE. However, just like with steroids, food elimination is not a cure. And they found that only 0.5% of children who did respond to an elimination diet were actually able to reintroduce all these foods back into their diet at some point. So there are still a lot of questions about these treatments. It is thought that it takes at least six weeks for the eosinophils to decrease in the esophagus, but you may see improvement in symptoms much sooner than that. It's also important that when you reintroduce foods, it is necessary that this be done one at a time so you can be sure about which food is truly tolerated and which food is really triggering symptoms. Unfortunately, at this point, we don't have any tests yet that can predict which foods trigger EOE symptoms, and most evidence would suggest that skin testing and Ig testing that we do for IgE-mediated food allergy is not helpful in identifying food triggers in EOE. There have also been reports, mostly in children, that some may experience an IgE-mediated anaphylactic-type reaction to a food that they once tolerated and had in their diet once they try to reintroduce the food after a period of avoidance. We don't know how frequently this happens, but it is something to keep in mind if you tend to have high IgE levels to foods. Unfortunately, the frequency that you have symptoms is not always a great indicator of your response to treatment, so it is really important to confirm that the inflammation has improved with an endoscopy and biopsy. And then finally, especially with food elimination diets, it's really important to monitor nutrition and growth, especially if several food groups are being avoided. So in summary then, patients with Lois Dietz syndrome appear to be at higher risk for developing nearly all forms of allergic disease, including allergic rhinitis, asthma, eczema, food allergy, and DOE. The methods we use to diagnose and treat these conditions are quite similar to those that we use in the general population, although we are more cautious about using epinephrine and allergen immunotherapy in patients with LDS because of the effects of these medications on the cardiovascular system. 
So finally, I just want to acknowledge the contributions of my research group here at the NIH and our colleagues at NIH, as well as Johns Hopkins, who we work with quite closely. Thank you so much, and I look forward to answering any questions you have. So we have quite a few questions um, in our Q&A. And I will just start by um, the one that got the most votes here for uh, Dr. Um, for Dr. Guerrero. Sorry, I was switching screens there to try and make sure I had all my right information in front of me. So the first no one we problem. have is um, what is known about MCAD or mast cell regulation in relation to connective tissue diseases? Hi, so for those of you that might not be familiar, MCAS or mast cell activation syndrome or disease is a condition where people have basically symptoms of anaphylaxis but without a trigger. So they may have hives and flushing, um, sometimes itchiness and swelling, GI symptoms are really common with abdominal cramping and sometimes diarrhea and vomiting. In some cases, they'll have more cardiovascular involvement with an elevated or high heart rate um, and sometimes even lower blood pressure. Uh, we don't know exactly why this happens to a group of people. Uh, we don't think that this is necessarily something that is increased in people with Lois Dietz syndrome. So people who have mast cell activation syndrome generally show high levels of mast cell mediators, including tryptase in their blood. Uh, that is something that we have been looking at in the patients who have been enrolled in our study at the National Institutes of Health. And we have not seen that increased in people with Lois Dietz. Thank you. Is that all of the question? <laughs> that, that, that whole question yeah, there. Okay. Um, next one. When is a good age to get a first allergy test done? My daughter is five and the only tests I've heard about are for adults. Sound, mm -hmm. It sounds scary for a five-year-old. Do they test just differently for little ones? Yeah, that's a question. So really the most important thing to consider about when to do allergy testing is when is there a clinical history that makes you really suspect allergy? So we definitely would never recommend doing allergy testing, especially for food allergy on everyone, uh, just because there is a high rate of false positive results where you have a positive test for a food, but you're not truly allergic. Five-year-old is actually quite common. Uh, the test can be somewhat less reliable in infants, particularly young infants, because their immune system is still developing. And so they might not have very much IgE. Uh, but the tests that we you do use are the skin tests and the blood tests, the same that we use at all the different ages. Um, it looks more um, probably scary than it is. It, it, you, most kids do pretty well with it. And if there is a problem doing the skin testing, then the blood testing is sometimes um, fine to use as well. Um, but again, it really depends on symptoms. We want to see a really strong suspicion for allergy before we would go ahead and, and do this testing. Uh, and the goal of the testing is really to confirm the allergy that we suspect it clinically. Great. Next question is, should generalized GI sensitivities in adult LDS patients warrant an allergy workup? What symptoms indicate potential immune issues that may require follow-up care? Yeah, it's not uncommon at all for people to have sensitivities to foods or so-called food intolerances that lead to GI symptoms. In the general population, almost one in three people at some point in their life will have some sort of a reaction to a food. And again, it's usually GI symptoms. We think more about a food allergy or an immune problem um, if we see that the reaction occurs immediately after eating the food. So if you eat a food and you have symptoms within an hour or two, then we might be more suspicious for an IgE type reaction. Um, if it's not the IgE type of allergic reaction, you can still have sort of GI, again, these sort of food intolerances. And we don't have any good tests for diagnosing those. There's really no diagnostic tests that we can do to figure out what foods might be triggering those symptoms. It's really um, trying to sort out based on when your symptoms happen and what foods you ate, which can be difficult because sometimes there's a long delay between when you develop symptoms after eating the food. It really would be more the eosinophilic GI disease that I had mentioned in my talk that we 
we would worry. So the symptoms to look out for there would be abdominal pain, vomiting, um, diarrhea, constipation. And in teenagers and adults, by far the most common symptom we see is trouble swallowing or dysphagia. Thank you for that. Um, next question, is the primary allergic response in LDS MCAS? Mm -hmm. If so, how does TGF beta factor in? And if so, what like meds, diet, or environment works best to reduce the problems from it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so back to the mast cell activation syndrome, we actually don't see that very commonly at all in Lois Eats syndrome. In fact, I don't know that I can even think of a patient we've seen who has officially been diagnosed with that. The allergy problems we see in LDS are really more related to this IgE type allergy. Again, seasonal allergies, asthma, food allergy, and then the GI disease with the eosinophils, those allergic white blood cells sort of accumulating in the GI tract. Um, the mast cell activation syndrome, again, it, the, the underlying problem is really with the mast cells, and we don't completely understand why people develop this, this condition. It really, for whatever reason, their mast cells just tend to be activated without being triggered by an allergen or other uh, sort of insult, and that can lead to symptoms. How would we retreat mast cell activation syndrome is usually with antihistamines. Uh, next question, is it likely that young adult LDS patients diagnosed with food allergies, and it says in parentheses, by very high IgE levels and skin tests during an episode of several complications after a major surgery will outgrow the allergy? Are allergy shots recommended? Should we be retested later in life when the body is not under stress from the flare-up or surgery? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the likelihood of someone outgrowing a food allergy, an Ig type food allergy, depends on a number of factors, and the most important one is really the food. So most people who are allergic to things like milk and wheat and soy, about half or 60% will grow that allergy by the time they're 10 years old or so. But it's much different for nuts. So of only about 20% of people who have a peanut allergy will ever outgrow their allergy, and it's even slightly lower for tree nuts, only about 10% of people. Uh, there's a number of factors that do contribute to that. So if you've had a history of having very severe reactions to the food, you're a little less likely to outgrow your allergy. If you have other allergic diseases such as eczema or asthma, you're also less likely uh, to outgrow your allergy. Uh, we generally test for repeat the Ig testing for allergies about once a year. Uh, it takes that long for really Ig levels to change in a meaningful way. And what we're looking for there is a drop in IgE levels. We have cutoffs or sort of threshold levels where we would offer an oral food challenge to the food to see if you've outgrown it. Um, but again, for peanuts and tree nuts, it's a really relatively small percentage of people who will outgrow that, unfortunately. That is unfortunate. <laughs> um, okay, next question. Uh, any link to dermographic urticaria rosacea, <laughs> anaphaloid reaction to contrast dye during, it says heart failure, shellfish, anaphylaxis, slow reactions, six hours, 24 hours after. Okay, so I think the first one was about demographic, urtic, demographic ur urticaria and rosacea. Uh, those two, I don't think there is a link between them. Uh, they're, they're usually very different diseases. So with uh, urticaria, that's basically a fancy word for hives. And again, it comes back to those mast cells in your skin. They get activated. They release all those mediators that they make. And that's what causes sort of the redness and swelling that you see with a hive. Rosacea, we don't we don't really understand what causes that very well either. It's another skin condition. Uh, the current thought that it might be sort of an abnormal immune response to the bacteria that live in our skin or how our body reacts to UV light. So the underlying mechanisms that cause both those conditions we think are different, but as you can probably tell, we don't understand either of them entirely. So that, that's something that I'm sure is ongoing in, in terms of study. Uh, for the contrast reaction. So contrast reactions are common, but it's actually not a true allergy. So when people have so-called an allergic or anaphylactic reaction to contrast, it's not an immune response. It's actually 
uh, has to do with the concentration of the drug in your bloodstream and that sometimes can activate mast cells non-specifically. Um, if you do have that sort of reaction to contrast, it is something that's really important to tell your anesthesiologist. A lot of, a lot of people who have that can still get contrast, but they just need to be pre-medicated. So it's just important that the, the doctors taking care of you know that you have that reaction. And then I think there was a question about shellfish allergy or delayed reactions. So again, most IgE type food allergies, you're gonna have symptoms within an hour or at most two hours of eating the food. Delayed reactions that happen you know, later that night or the next day are less likely to be IgE mediated, um, but that is something that an allergist can help you sort through. And there is testing that uh, we can do, usually the skin testing or the blood testing to help sort that out. Well, I'm really glad that you, that you know how to say all those things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm going to give it the old try here. That's right. <laughs> okay, this one is from someone who says um, they have Marfan syndrome um, and have been fighting with urticaria for 10 years now. Doctor says can't find a cause from it. On two allergy medications, Allegra and Monolucastat. Monolucast. Oh, <laughs> and still <laughs> need prednisone for breakthroughs every few months. Could this be Marfan related? And if so, any treatments that might be more effective? Mm -hmm. So what this is, is, is chronic persistent urticaria. And again, there's usually no cause that's identified. It's the fancy word idiopathic, which means we don't know, which is the most common reason people get this sort of hives that last this long. Um, I don't think it's related to the Marfan syndrome. We haven't seen that as a common um, sort of finding in people with Marfan syndrome, but there are actually quite effective treatments. So you're on some of them already. Usually antihistamines are the first step uh, in terms of how we would treat this. You can actually use quite high doses and going up on the dose of antihistamines can sometimes help uh, get the hives under better control. But if um, all those fail, then the next step is a drug called Zolaire or Omalizumab. That's, um, I'll give you the brand name, it's X-O-L-A-I-R. This is an antibody that binds IgE, the allergic antibody. And there's been a number of good studies now suggesting it can be really effective in people who have this chronic persistent urticaria or hives that has not responded to other medications. So that's something uh, definitely an allergist should be able to help you with. Okay. Um, my daughter has had an allergy workup, but still needs singular and al albuterol. Is this just asthma or could it be something else? Can't find a certain trigger besides seasonal uh, fire smoke and always happens in the spring um, and winter here in Northern California. Yeah, so it sounds like it could be asthma. There are a lot of other factors that can trigger asthma other than allergies. So it's good that you start with an allergy workup, especially if you um, know you have Lois Dietz syndrome, since we know allergies are more common. Um, but some people will have allergies even, or asthma even when we get their allergies under really good control and, and they may still need medication. So that's not completely surprising. Um, certainly irritants like smoke is another important factor for triggering asthma in some patients. So. Um, you know, I, I think it's very possible that she may still need some medications to keep her asthma under good control, even if you've optimally controlled all her allergies. Okay. Um, can you explain the link between food allergy and constipation? Yeah, there are certain patients, um, and you might have heard the other Dr. Guerrero speak this morning about sort of milk being a trigger in some patients with constipation. It's not very common, and certainly in somebody with a connective tissue disease, uh, you know, food would not be the first thought into terms of what I think would be triggering their constipation. Um, it really has more to do with how the muscles work in the in the intestines and the connective tissue issue. So. Um, Food elimination would not be my first step, even though it is sometimes involved or as a trigger in some patients, but it's, it's not the most common reason for constipation. So there are a few questions in here related to, um, I know you talked about a little, I talked, you talked about this quite a bit during your presentation, but maybe just to um, reiterate a little bit, there's a question about Children were diagnosed with multiple food allergies by an allergist when they were young, and they were advised to avoid those foods to keep their allergies from worsening with re repeated exposure. And now 
um, they have their teenagers with really restrictive diet mm -hmm. diets, um, and they're interested in how to safely broaden those diets. That's a really good question, and, and certainly something that I am extremely interested in. We have a whole new clinical trial actually to address that. So it, it comes back really to how our testing for food allergy is less than ideal. So, and this is particularly a problem in people who also have eczema because they tend to have very high total IgE levels and they often test positive to foods even when they're not allergic to it. And it, it's a big problem because, you know, we know that in some patients, food is an important trigger for eczema. And so it's not uncommon for people to get these allergy tests and then they're told to avoid all these different foods. So we're actually trying to do a number of studies to uh, figure out what the Ig levels are where it would be safe to reintroduce those foods back into the diet. Uh, this is where you're really going to need an allergist who's comfortable doing oral food challenges, who's comfortable with food allergy to help you sort out which of these foods you really need to be avoiding and which you might be able to reintroduce to your diet. Um, but it's not an uncommon problem at all, whether you have Lois Z syndrome or just in the general population. We see this all the time and, and more than ever now we recognize that we really do need to be more aggressive about doing food challenges. I just, I'm a little more cautious in people with Lois Dietz syndrome because again, when you do a food challenge, we're giving you the food that you're potentially allergic to. And that can lead to severe allergic reactions. And in someone with Lois Dietz syndrome, using medicines like epinephrine are, um, you know, we don't want to use them unless we absolutely have to because of the cardiovascular effects. So uh, that is a, a question or a situation where you definitely want to have an allergist that feels comfortable treating severe allergic reactions and in a hospital setting where if something did happen, you know, related to their cardiovascular health, that they would be prepared to treat that. So here's another one too, the kind of going um, a bit a little bit different direction, but is it true that avoiding exposure to foods to which you tested allergic can increase your allergic response to them? Um, and if so, what role should allergy test play in planning diet? Yeah, it's a good question. So our, the pendulum has really swung in both directions in allergies. So for the longest time, until very recently, just a few years ago, we would tell parents who, uh, whose children are at high risk for allergy to avoid all allergenic foods until the child was at least three. And that guidance now has completely changed. Uh, and that was based on a study that was actually done in the United Kingdom with peanut allergy, where they took kids who were at high risk for developing peanut allergy. These were children four to 11 months of age who had either egg allergy and or eczema. And they split the kids into two groups. Half the group were told to introduce peanut into their diet very early at four to 11 months of age. And the other half were told to strictly avoid peanut until they turned five years of age. And they found a very dramatic result. The children who introduced peanut into their diet as babies in that first year of life were at dramatically reduced rates of having peanut allergy than the kids who were strictly avoiding it. So now we recommend, and that was true even for kids who already tested positive to peanut. So there was a subgroup of those infants who already had a positive skin test or a positive Ig test to peanut, but they were still able to eat it without having a reaction. And even in those kids, early introduction of peanut did protect them from developing peanut allergy. So this is again another case um, where you know having an allergist who can help you decipher this. Um, this can be very helpful uh, in terms of the safety of whether it's safe to introduce the foods at home or whether you might need to come to clinic and do that in an office setting and introduce it there in case you would have an allergic reaction. Very good. I think I have I've grabbed all the um, food related ones, although there is a question here about food allergies causing eczema, and I think you've already answered that. Um, Let's see. So here's another question on desensitization. Boy, I am having a hard time tonight. Um, this one, they uh, specifically asked about, they said they had a good response to grass pollen and are trying dust next. Okay, good response. I wonder, they mean with, with allergy shots or by testing they had it? It just says views on desensitization. Okay. Desensitization. desensitization, yeah. So that was probably with allergy shots. Yeah. So um, 
So again, you know, I talked a little bit about this in my talk about allergy shots. They are actually very effective. So 80% of people who do allergy shots do say that their symptoms improve, their symptoms of allergic rhinitis specifically do improve. Um, but it's really just the cost benefit in people with low ease deeds because it's just not uncommon. We're, we're injecting into you the, the allergens that you're allergic to. And so there is a substantial risk of having an anaphylactic type reaction where you would need to use epinephrine to treat it. So that is generally why we would not recommend it for people with low ease deeds. Uh, generally, we can get those type of symptoms under good control with medications, usually nasal steroids or the antihistamines. Um, let's see. Um, so you said that sometimes if LDS patients avoid food, they can develop an IgE type reaction. What factors go into the decision to avoid that food completely? Yeah, this isn't true just in Lois Dietz. It's really true in the general population where you know, people were usually eating the food at one point and then were told to avoid it for a period of time um, for a couple reasons. It may be that we thought it was triggering their eczema, so we asked people to avoid it for that. Or we think that food may be triggering their EOE, and so we asked them to avoid it for that reason. And then when we try to reintroduce the food, they have an anaphylactic type reaction to it. At this point, we have absolutely no predictors of who that will be, who's going to have that anaphylactic, more immediate type reaction once we reintroduce it to the diet. It's just one of the reasons that we're much more hesitant about avoiding foods um, to treat eczema. So the current guidelines actually recommend that food allergy testing not be done in people with eczema unless it's been not possible to get their eczema under control with topical treatments, either emollients or topical steroids, and they have a clinical reason to suspect foods. Um, in the case of EOE, food elimination is commonly used to try and control the symptoms there. Um, but again, it's one of the reasons that once the inflammation has improved, we do recommend reintroducing foods one at a time to really try and limit the number of foods being avoided um, as much as possible. So here's another um, one sort of on those lines. So we're talking about uh, a 14 month old in this case um, who has been on a lactose free diet and um, he says very balanced otherwise and asking about should maybe looking at a supplement for calcium and or vitamin D. So lactose free actually is fine. It, it has all the protein in it. So that's very different than somebody who's on a milk free diet. So lactose is just one of the sugars that is found in milk, but that lactose free milk still has the protein and the calcium that you would find in, in normal, quote, normal milk. Um, it's still important to make sure that kids are getting adequate calcium and vitamin D for their bones, but uh, kids that are on a lactose free diet are not necessarily at higher risk for being deficient in those vitamins and minerals. Okay, switching tracks here a little bit. There are several questions about um, EpiPens. Um, they're just asking about the risk factors. This uh, person says specifically have had really bad anaphylactic reaction to morphine and some other things and EpiPen situation is concerning. Um, you know, who to, who to talk to or, or what, what risks to bring to whoever um, someone should speak, to, someone if you should speak to someone. Yeah, so this is, you know, especially important in schools and daycares and, you know, just sort of having in your general sort of Lois Dietz repertoire of knowledge that it, it really all comes back to the underlying cardiovascular disease. Um, so what epinephrine does is it acts on the heart. It increases the heart rate and it increases your blood pressure. And those are both things that we really don't want to do in somebody who might have an aneurysm or underlying cardiovascular disease. Um, that being said, if you are having a true life-threatening anaphylactic reaction, absolutely the cost or the benefit is going to outweigh the cost, you know, and that's why we recommend that you have an EpiPen available. So then the question is, is when do you use it? And, you know, this is, this is, it's hard to point to any one symptom. So if you have, are having trouble breathing, any problem with your respiratory tract where you can't breathe, you can't catch your breath, you know, absolutely you should be using epinephrine in those situations. If your blood pressure is dropping, if you have two or more systems involved, so if you are covered head to toes in hives and you're also vomiting profusely, Again, it's, it's appropriate to use epinephrine in those cases. 
Um, I have taken care of many LDS patients who have used epinephrine and all of them have responded fine to it. Uh, so it's not necessarily that there is guaranteed to be an issue if you need to use epinephrine. Um, but again, we are judicial in when we use it. And you know, if you need it, if you're having those types of severe reactions, then yes, go ahead and use it. Um, but if you are just having some mild itching around your mouth or one or two hives, then go ahead and treat those type of reactions with antihistamines first before going directly to epinephrine. Okay, hopefully there are several folks who had questions around that same line. So hopefully we've covered all of the angles that those were coming at. Um, a little bit different track here. Does there seem to be any link between multiple food allergies, silicone and nylon contact allergies? Uh, this one says, and Marfan syndrome, but we could probably broaden that out. Yeah, we, um, we haven't actually seen more allergies in Marfan syndrome. Um, that sort of observation has been more unique to Lois Dietz syndrome. Uh, I'm not aware of an increase in contact allergies either. They're slightly different from an immunologic perspective. The allergies that we see in LDS are again that eosinophilic GI type or the IgE type, but not so much a contact allergy reaction to nickel and, and other products like that. And we don't really see either in Marfan syndrome at a higher rate than what you would see in the general population. Okay. Um, also, some questions related to allergies changing um, after surgeries. So, um, you know, do, do allergies get more sensitive after surgery or, or as we age? Um, I've seen, I see questions in here kind of from LDS and also from Marfan mm -hmm. on that type of, top, type, of, type of question. Yeah, I don't know that surgeries per se, but we do know that stress can certainly you know, affect one's immune system. So you can imagine a scenario where that might be the case. Um, I would, I, you know, it hasn't been something that I've seen studied in sort of a systematic way, um, but we do know that stress and emotional stress and anxiety can all affect you know, allergies and reactions to allergies and certainly our immune system. It's something that once you've recovered from the surgery, hopefully you would go back to your baseline. Um, in terms of just sort of the overall course of allergies across time, uh, you know, Usually most people will outgrow food allergies, so they are most prevalent in early childhood, and then people start to outgrow them. Um, at least the main foods, peanut and tree nuts, as I mentioned earlier, are some exceptions where most people don't outgrow them. Um, asthma, allergic rhinitis, those can get worse with age and depending on the part of the country where you live. Um, so those, those are variables that can sometimes also change during puberty, either get better or get worse. It can go in both directions. Um, and can wax and wane sort of throughout life, but there's no sort of um, single way that they evolve with time and with age. Okay, and I think this is probably gonna have to be the last question, just noting the time. Um, just a reminder to everyone, if you, uh, if we were not able to answer your question or it did not, we did not get specific enough for your question tonight, I know I was trying to lump a few in together here just to try and get as much covered as we could. Um, please do use the marfan.org slash e3ask link to submit your question. We'll be passing those along either to the docs, the specialists that are with us through E3, or our on-staff nurse um, will be answering questions just as quickly as we can get them turned around. Um, this last, there are a couple questions around, and I know this is important because of all the um, imaging work that folks with connective tissue conditions need to have done. Um, question about CT media and different other contrast dyes potentially used in an HSG. Um, and then also along those same lines, um, you know, after many CT scans in the past, had an anaphylactic reaction to the contrast dye um, and developed HIT hit due to an allergy with heparin. So just, I guess, thoughts on that and are those different uh, media in the, are, are there different media to maybe look for if you've had a reaction yeah. to one or the other? Yes, that's actually quite common. So contrast reactions are really common. We see them all the time as allergists, but they're actually not a true allergy. They look all the world like an allergy. You get all the same symptoms with a drop in your blood pressure and difficulty breathing and hives. It looks exactly like that because 
the same sort of thing is happening where these mast cells are getting activated, but they're not getting activated because of an Ig antibody or an allergy. They're getting activated because of the osmolarity of the drug. It's, it's the concentration of the drug and how that um, sort of non-specifically activates mast cells. So there's a couple things you can do. Um, sometimes they can use a different contrast media that won't cause that same problem. So sometimes it is very unique to specific contrast media in a given person. And the other thing they can do is give you medications before giving you the contrast to try and reduce the symptoms um, from the mast cells being activated. So those are the two techniques that we would generally try and um, use in those situations. That's really good to know. I'm sure that's relevant to a lot of our community members who are frequently coming into contact with those types of um, testing situations. Sure. So with that, like I said, if your question wasn't answered here, please do submit through that website, markin.org slash e3ask. Um, and please uh, bear with us with a little bit of extra patience as the volume of questions is very high right now, but we do very much want to get everyone addressed as best we can. Um, thank you so much for completing your surveys um, with this session and all that you are uh, participating in throughout E3. We are using that and we'll be using that feedback to help, uh, help guide future education and offerings that um, we want to be sure people have um, and we want to be sure that we are offering the best possible available now. So if you are viewing either through the app or through your through a website or through a browser, just below the screen where your um, video is playing, there should be a button or a link that says rate it or rate this. If you could click that, it doesn't even take a whole minute to do. Um, we very much appreciate your feedback on this session and all others. Um, speaking of which, we hope you continue take, to take advantage of sessions throughout the summit and do connect with the exhibitors in the virtual exhibit hall. Um, there are some really great resources in there that may be useful to you or your families. And if you are not connecting in the community through the Whova app or on the website, you are missing out on some great connections, both folks connecting over medical similarities, but also just you know life stuff with people who get it, get what it's like to live with Louise Dietz or Mark Van or VEDS or uh, any, any connective tissue condition or um, aortic condition. And it's, there's a lot of really good information being shared and also a lot of fun. And speaking of which, if you are having an experience that, wants, that you wanna share about that online, um, please use the hashtag E3Summit20 and that will help us see what all everybody's up to and you should be able to check that out as well to see what others have posted. Um, thank you again so much to Dr. Pam Guerrero here. We are so grateful to get your expertise on this topic um, and for your practical information that you've shared. I know um, this has been a very, very good pr presentation and um, I am sure that we have all really learned a lot. We appreciate the time you took to put in to putting into this and um, for your willingness to share that expertise with all of us. So with that, yes, absolutely. my pleasure. I just want to say one more thank you if I can. I know we're late. Um, it's really to everybody out there who's been a part of our study. I, the reason that I was able to share all this information with you is because you all have been extremely generous with your time coming to the NIH, participating in these studies, and helping us learn about Lois Deet. So if you're one of those people who's part of our study already, thank you. If you're interested in being part of our study, please let us know. But um, I know all this information because you have taught us all this. So thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. I also just dropped into the chat um, the on the Lois Deeds website, loisdeeds.org. I dropped in the link to any of the current studies that are going on. Um, there's also a link to something, uh, to a similar link on the Marfan website, so, and some of them cross over. So if you're interested in participating in studies, uh, please do. And you know, your, uh, your counterpart this morning mentioned too that if it's not something you experience, it's still important to participate because it allows the uh, population to have a better, um, an understanding of the full, the full impact within the whole Louis Dietz population. That's right. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank have you all. Your day, wherever you are in the world, <laughs> and hope to see you all again on another session soon. Mm -hmm. Good night. Bye bye.